Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. <clears throat> Appalachian Podcast, the number one podcast in the German Baptist community. I'm your host, Billy Riddle. <laughs> why is that? Why is somebody always laugh? That's our that's our thing. We gotta we, I, we gotta I, tell it. I mean, you're coming off the blocks, straight out with it. It works. Well, well <laughs> done, Billy. Our, no one's pulled you up over it yet, which well, I'm staggered at. Well, because that would be a conflict of interest. If anybody approached me about it, they'd mean they actually listen to the show, and they'd be kind of they'd be out in themselves. So our biggest supporting base doesn't even listen to the show, so you just want Amos. They can't. What a strategy! What a strategy! That's fine. That's fine. We get we get support in other ways. Speaking of which, one of them. But I saw him this afternoon before I started heading up a road. Uh, I look over in my front yard and I see somebody's bare ass coming up at me. And it was Joel. I was about to say, it wasn't me? No, 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 oh, no. no. It wasn't you. So. Uh, anyway, I'm back with my co-host, yeah, I'm back home. Simon Winch. He, uh, uh, well, undoubtedly bring up a cricket reference today. I'm, I've already now. brought one up, actually. I'm going to bring it up again because it's relevant, but I'll save that for a little bit later, just for a giggle. We could probably do without. But uh, anyway, also got Chip Slate back here again. Chip, how's uh, how's life? It's it's good to be here. Things are moving fast. You know, everything in the past week's been pretty insane, but um, you know, we've got a happier subject today to talk about. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's what a, what a, well, yeah, that's why I'm kind of, guys was coming up the road here today and I was kind of, as well, I was a few minutes late, I'd bypassed the exit listening to lithium radio. I was reminded of the nineties mm-hmm. rolling around on back roads up here without social media and, and, uh, and, and today's going to be kind of a, a jump into that. I, I need to make a public safety announcement, by the way, for all the race car drivers around here coming up Ferrum Mountain Road and up and over the mountain down into Ferrum. They put a lot of gravel down on that road, and you can't drive it like you think you can. A lot of gravel on the road, and that's the road you want to throw the car around. But anyway, don't do it for the minute. Loose gravel. What do you mean throw the car around for a bit? Man, I drive that road like a rally driver. You can't help it. It's cambered perfectly. Do you have one of those little Mini Coopers that Austin Powers had? (laughs) Shall we shag now or shall we shag later? Is that what you're expecting, Billy? Really? I'm expecting something. Most of the time on a motorcycle, I'm sure a motorcycle driver is going to go oh. hit it before it's said and done on that road. But Yeah, not with that gravel on it now. Don't do it, whatever you do. But yeah, it's uh, been a fun week <clears throat> uh, as far as your side of things is concerned. Uh, it's just, it, you know, the meme holiday, you know, carries on, but it, it's just things have moved so fast in the past week with this country. Uh, you know, how do you keep up with it? I, I don't even want to keep up with it. I really do. I just, at this point, like at this point in time, I just want to just shut it all off and go find me a spot on top of a mountain somewhere and cut down some logs and live underneath that and let my wife nag me to death until. Well, that's why I'm excited we have, you know, this kind of podcast today. It sort of takes our mind off of that and we can enjoy it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We've got, uh, of course, Carter Chipwood back today. So if you know Carter is, uh, is here, we've got a good sports show. Appreciate was, y'all bringing uh, me back. I was like, been treating you. It's been a while. I think last one we had you on was, was it Nick? Nick. Yep. Up at the burger company. Yeah, that was uh that That's was right. a good one. Uh how's he doing here lately? Good. I haven't had a chance he's, to keep up. I think he's back off injury reserve. He's back in AAA in Memphis, throwing and rehabbing and trying to get back up. What what injury did he did he suffer? Uh he had some inflammation in his arm Ooh. from where he had had surgery, I think, in college. Yeah, yeah. So he's trying to work through some issues. They don't think it's anything related to that, just had some inflammation and some soreness. So they That's shut the him last, down and it's the last thing a pitcher wants, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's 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 hope he heals up and he's been throwing well since he got it. back in Memphis. He's been throwing well, it looks like. Good, good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Well, so obviously we got a we got a sports show, so we got Abe Naff back in. It's gonna be one of those baseball episodes. Coach, it's uh it's good to have you back in here. Actually, Coach Naff has one of the uh, one of our top three listen to shows of all time. People like to tune in and hear what he's gotta say. So we always appreciate having him on. I appreciate y'all letting me come down and talk. We do have a really special. Well, you had a little bit of comic relief that I don't think a lot of people are expecting. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you're able to sit here and keep keep Carter a little honest every right. now and then. So, right. and also we got Eric Owens here, the new head baseball coach at Fairham College, and somebody you know around here. Back when we were growing up, there were only two baseball teams. It was the Atlanta Braves and Fairham College. That's it. Nobody cared about Tech. Nobody cared about UVA. It was up here. And that's probably, you know, here and probably surrounding five or six counties. That's all anybody ever talked about or cared about. So it's good to see you back in town. And uh, thank you for coming on the show tonight. Thank you. I appreciate being here. So uh, I guess the first question is, 
uh, what the hell are you doing back at Farum? <laughs> I miss Bowen's hot dogs so bad. I had to come back here and, and go to Bowen's and be able to have hot dogs. I, <laughs> I can't drive by Bowen's anymore. Uh, I go to Rocky Mount to go get something. I stop at Bowen's on the way home. Uh, no, actually, I'm back here because uh, I love Farum College. I, I want to see if I can, uh, you know, I'm in a twilight of my coaching career, as you can say. I still got some many more years to go, but uh, to be able to come 360 all the way around and be able to try to build this program back up, especially going to uh, Division Two, uh, it's been a dream of mine. Uh, you know, you can play in the big leagues and stuff, but I still have that pit from 1992 when we didn't uh, make it to the World Series. So it, I'm kind of it's a kind of a good thing that I can come back here and try to do it uh, for the Farm College community in Franklin County and Roanoke area because when I like. You said when I was here, it was special. And uh, when you're a fair and Panther, it was special. And I played football and baseball here, and everyone knew who you were. And, um, you know, I still get goosebumps this day to be able to say I was a Panther. Well, let's bring it back. Yeah, let's we've, uh, back. you know, we've uh, honestly, I've, I've, I went to Emory and Henry, and there was a big rival of Fair. Um, the, uh, I ended up quitting football to go overseas. So the only significant playing time I got was. I got in a couple series at the end of the game against Farum down at Emory and got a sack. Last play of the game, number forty five, and it was like Rudy in the flesh. I'm, I mean, people on the sidelines chanting. It was, uh, it was a beautiful. Thing. And then I think uh, the following year, I got sent up here on a uh, on Billy. Were you carried off on your players' <laughs> shoulders? <laughs> no, because I think we won like thirty seven to six. Nobody really cared oh, right. at the end. It wasn't like a big moment. We didn't, we didn't. Uh, it, it, but the following year, I came up, and that's the only game I dressed for on the road. And then I quit a couple of weeks after that because I was like, hey, I'm going to Iraq, and I don't really, I don't really have the the mindset to come out here and uh, keep putting. So, uh, you know, fun, but being my hometown, it's always been special to me. And, and be able to come up here, and we've had, you know, we've had Coach Naff on a handful of times. We've had Dr. Martin on. We've had Coach At. Is he still a football coach up here? Oh, okay. Well, we had the former football coach, uh, Cleve Adams, on uh, during his uh, hot streak here a couple. Yeah, but he's the athletic he's director now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's he's, he's running the, the show now. Look like yeah. nope, he's gone out the door. Like, <laughs> well, just, uh, uh, there's a story. Uh, uh, watch well, out. Still here. Yeah, right. if you have a question, I can give you his phone number. What's the reason? He's about athletic. athletic. He's a speed he's head head football right coach now. now. So who's the head coach now for the football team? Kevin Sherman. Okay, I remember that name somehow. Why do I know that name? He was a teammate of mine. Okay. When I play, and uh, he was wide receiver here, and uh, he he was a very good football player here for Farm College, and right. uh, but he was on Beamer staff at, at at Tech. Yeah, he's been on several D one staffs before. Tim Burr staff yeah. at Wake Forest, Pittsburgh, Ohio University, Buffalo University, of Buffalo. Just a great guy. They've been kind of knocking out of the park here lately with the hires bringing them back into town. Yeah. Sounds like some energy's coming back, which is great to hear because this facility, by the way, if any if anyone doesn't know, we're actually up in the. Uh, uh, the box here at the uh, the the baseball uh, pitch here. And field, no, that'd be, field. That would be the it's diamond. Pitch, whatever. <laughs> I'm a bloody Englishman. Get over it. It's a diamond. Oh, and a diamond. I can see it all. There's, I mean, there's a few things missing, but, you know, where's the kegerator? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but this is where we're at, and uh, this is my first time up here, and, and it, it really is a facility that that uh, it just blows it blows me away. It's 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 absolutely superb. Well, my parents would always bring us up here growing up. My dad, especially on the weekends, to see games. Because, I mean, back, I mean, we we were so spoiled. We had, you know, growing up, we had Chris Warren to come watch football, and we had Billy and Eric right here to come watch baseball. And and every time he turned around, it was just something really exciting going on. You had all the history and people coming and tailgating. It was always it was always something special, you know. And and I don't know if if it still goes on like that up here. I've kind of gotten away. From, I don't even go to Emory and and participate in that kind of thing, but. When I come up from the Folk Life Festival, I love to see all the people and think, man, this 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 place needs it. So I'm good to see uh how how did those conversations come to be exactly? Did um when when exactly were you approached about coming back down here and doing all this thing? Cause I know I've been back and forth with y'all for a while trying to get a get something going, but getting all y'all back into town to do a show. Uh and uh all of a sudden Carter hits me up a few weeks ago and says, Oh, he's a head coach now. I said, What? <laughs> well, what happened was, is to be honest with you, is like um, uh, I had cancer in my left kidney, and this is how it all started. So I had my left kidney removed in May, at the end of May, and um, and so what happened was, is I had a lot of people from Farm reach out to me and stuff like that, and that was Abe and and Cleve, just people just saying, "Hey, how are you? How are you doing?" and all that stuff. And uh, once they um, decided to make a decision on the baseball. Uh, 
on the baseball program, uh, I actually got a phone call and said, Hey, uh, and it wasn't from anyone here in Ferrum just said, Hey, would you be interested in coming back home? And I was like, uh, let me think about it for a couple of days. And I thought about it and I was up in Canada and I'm like, you know what, this would be a great time for me to be able to do this. My uh, kids are, or graduated from college and on their way doing their own thing. I said, so if there's an opportunity for me to be able to do this, this is a time. And so I called back and just threw my name in a hat and just, uh, you know, just trying to, to see if there's interest or not. And it just, one thing led to another and, uh, I'm sitting how's, here today. How's your prognosis, by the way? Bearing in mind, I'm going through uh, a similar I'm thing. Cancer right free now. is right now. So Fantastic. It, yeah. So it's, uh, it was kind of odd uh, how it happened, but yeah, I'm cancer free now. So I just got to get you checked out, make sure yeah. I'm monitored and all that stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's how it kind of happened. So, you know, you think about having cancer and you're down in the dumps and then, yeah, three months later, you're you're uh, you're sitting uh, in a in an office and trying to get players better and stuff like that. Yep. So it's and and trying to recruit and things like that. So uh, a little bit behind the eight ball because this happened a little late for me. But I mean, you're learning on the job, and and I'm I'm trying to get uh, all the administrative stuff done now, so that once the players get here, I can coach baseball and not worry about the uh, paperwork. That's the key, right? And it also allows you to focus on something apart from cancer treatment and that prospect so i get it yeah i mean it's it, i was very lucky to be honest with you is that i had uh when i was in british columbia canadian uh health is a little bit different and but i i really got sped up through it i think by the time i was diagnosed till i had had my kidney removed it was like six weeks so they really took care of me i have two uh urologists i had like 15 assistants and yep. uh two anesthesiologists i'm like oh am i dying today they're like no you're not going anywhere today we got enough people here to bring you back so they treated it aggressively it which, was unbelievable which right, how they, which is yeah. the right course to do yeah because my my tumor was uh 10 centimeters by the time he took it out Whoa. so uh uh, yeah, so that's you know, just went and got my blood work done, just saying, hey, I want to go get a uh, um, a physical because I hadn't had one in years, and so I just went and got a physical, and my blood work came back all messed up, and I've been in pretty much good shape all my life, and yeah, ate right and did all that stuff. And they yep. said it didn't matter; it, it, it was no symptoms or anything. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's in you know, it's kind of like the war of eighteen twelve. It's in the past, but it's going to be in the present uh, of yep. your mind all the time. But it was definitely uh, eye opening. Did you get the um, prognosis as to whether it was genetic or environmental because that to me was a big, big free up mentally was it what my my cancer wasn't genetic so i thought okay so it's environmental there were a number of factors that that, that that led to it but having that um prognosis of it being environmental from a genetic study is really good news even though it's kind of really shitty news that you've got cancer but the fact that it's not genetic means that your kids don't have it and and to have an environmental um, prognosis is as best a prognosis as you can get, you know, in a kind of twisted way. Well, the, I mean, look, I mean, I don't want to get into, like, as I was brought up, you don't talk about politics and religion and all that stuff. The only thing I've done different is I lost 25 pounds and I got COVID shots in my left arm every single time. And my right, my right kidney is completely clean. My arteries are complete. My pancreas, every they went through my whole entire body, right? And they, they was just like a freaking nature. I thought it might have been my diet, the way I was living life, whatever's going on. And they're like, they, all the doctors said we have no idea how this happened. Yeah, but I'm glad it was a kidney because you live with one kidney, and if it's any other organ, you're not, you're probably not around very much longer. Yeah, you can struggle with it for sure. Yeah. But that's a great, that's a great prognosis. I mean, and. For you coming here, this is like the icing on the cake for Ferrum, from what I hear. You know, <laughs> well, I hope you come and watch it. I mean, we're gonna, I'm absolutely. We're going to we're gonna try to get this thing right around here. We're going to try to bring uh, Franklin County back together and 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 the surrounding areas and and get people out to the games and get Franklin County High School uh, baseball players and and people want to come to Ferrum instead of going somewhere else. And we're going to treat everyone um, like I was treated when I came here as a player throughout Rocky mountain everywhere. And so we're just trying to bring the community back together. We're going to do a lot of fundraising stuff, uh, trying to get, you know, this place to be, uh, it, it is beautiful. I agree with you, but we got a lot of work to do, uh, to get it to, uh, division two status. And so right. there's a lot of things that we're going to do and we got on the plate and we're going to need the whole community to help this thing out. I mean, we can't do it alone. Um, you know, if you're a lone ranger, you're not in the same for very long. It takes the community. It's just a community to raise a player. I was going to say, well. before we get into your visions of what you want to do here in your tenure at Ferrum, why don't you um, 
let the listeners know and the ones that are in this room that may not know more about you. Tell us how you got here to Ferrum the first time. Abe, you can help. Um, and what you did. In I'll, your I'll let Abe start this story. About and where you ended your career and, and, and what you did through your and, career. And, and blowing Ferrum College off at Tunstall High School. <laughs> you know, Eric was a great player. Football, basketball, and baseball. Basketball probably being An all rounder is what you're saying. But he played football and, and baseball here at Ferrum. So I recruited him, and, you, you know, you go see a guy like that, you just know he could play. And he knew he could play, so he big-timed me that firm wasn't big enough for uh, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> so he went to Lewisburg Junior College. He said, just, you know, whatever. <laughs> so he Still, goes down there thinking he's big stuff and whatever, and he can't play there. Coach told him he couldn't play, wasn't good enough. But Eric ended up going in fourth round with Cincinnati. And Eric will not talk about himself, so I'll I'll take the time to let you know how good he <laughs> was. You know, he played three years here, and uh, and came uh, in January, so he was here three springs. And two of those springs, he was a first team All American. He was the National Player of the Year in 1992, voted the best player in the country. And he's the only Ferrum athlete ever to get that. Am I exactly. correct? Yeah, and. Uh, he's the best athlete that's ever been at Ferrum College. Mm-hmm. That's football, basketball, and baseball. And the legendary Hank Norton would tell you the same thing. And uh, I was going to say, I've been around the program a long time with my cousin being Abe's long-term assistant back in the day, and he might be the best I've ever seen put on paracletes on this field. Undoubtedly. He was just a, you know, a player. Uh, let me tell you some things he did. The good things. We won't get into the other things. <laughs> That'd be too long. We will. Oh, uh, we we will. <laughs> we'll do those off mic. We'll, we'll talk about his own field uh, <laughs> success. But uh, I never, you know, coaching third base, I would never put my hands up or wave him on or whatever because that was just alerting the mm-hmm. defense. Right. Eric knew what to do. He scored from second base twice on a pass ball. Wow. Now, this this is a guy that was the fastest. Grease lightning. Fastest mm-hmm. right-handed hitter from home to first in the National League when he played for San Diego. The guy can fly. Okay. So don't look at the body now. <laughs> in the regionals. It's in the stats. Scored, That's all that counts. He scored from third base on a pop-up to the second baseman. The That's second wild. baseman caught the ball, and he tags up and scores. <laughs> Tagged up from second on a fly ball to center and scored. The guy was unbelievable. Stole home in the big leagues, a straight steal I in remember the big that. leagues. That was a Sports Center top 10 highlight, I, I remember, because right. that, that, that wasn't a throw to second, and, and he, it was a straight steal to home. Sweet. In the big leagues. You know, you just don't do that. You can't no, do that. That, that, that takes speed that? and balls. Yeah. I mean, when did that, that happen most? All right, he's a quarterback. He's a quarterback on the football team, and Coach Norton. You know, ran the wishbone. So he makes the pitch to the running back. Beats the running back to the goal line, makes the block <laughs> for him to score. Oh, I bet he let you know. I bet that running back knew about that for years. All right. So his junior year, he's play, He's on the football team. football team goes to the University of Alabama, Birmingham, to play them. I don't know what to score, but Eric's a quarterback. They drive back that Saturday. You know, get back two or three, four o'clock in the morning. He gets on a plane on Sunday, flies to Homestead, Florida, to try out for the United States Olympic team in baseball. Hasn't taken a fungo, hadn't hit in the cage, and he's the last one cut to make the oh, man. Olympic team. Why did and go? I know that because one of my buddies was on the coaching staff at that time. He wasn't my buddy at that time. He became my buddy later. And, and uh <laughs> Joe Carbone from Ohio University. And he told me that Eric was the last one uh, not to make and hadn't and practiced, that, that practiced is, any baseball. That's a that's a testament right there. And it had just gotten right? tar beat out of him at, at, Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess Alabama, Alabama, Birmingham. 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 <laughs> he just you know, he was sore. Yeah, it wasn't long after that UAB was division one. Right. I yep. mean, mm-hmm. I don't know where the transition took place, but I remember because Michael Vick's first game was against JMU. I went up there for that one. We had tickets the following week for UAB. I remember my dad laughing because he was a UVA fan. I don't know why. 
laughing and joking and saying, oh, UAB used to play Farum, you know. And But, I mean, I guess they've been to some bowl games and stuff since, but was that around their transition? when they were Yeah, playing? that was around their transition. But, I mean, the claim to fame of that thing, whole entire thing. Back then, Auburn and Alabama used to play – their their game, their regular season game at, at Legion Field yeah. in Birmingham. So to be able to walk out there and see all the history and stuff of Bear Bryant and those guys being there, it was pretty cool. To, and the only reason – Brandon Williams was hurt because I played wide receiver a lot when he was quarterback and – uh, and then, but he was hurt for that game. So I ended up starting that game, uh, and being able to quarterback that game. And then I had down to Homestead, Florida, and I was running about a six, four, sixty the summer before. And I think I ended up running like a six, seven, sixty when I was down there. But like Abe said, I was just so sore, yep. just tight from, and then getting on a plane and trying to get down there. And they ran us dehydrated. Uh, yeah. That'll, that'll I mean, do yeah, it. I'm sure that they had, but well, they made us run to 60 the first day that you got there. I, I think if I had another day, I would have been better. But I mean, you know, it is what it is. Everything works out. But that's that to me is a confidence in your own ability, right? And you can't train that. You can't train that. Well, Skip Bergman was a head coach of that team, of the Olympic team. And uh, he called me. You know, he's a legendary baseball coach at LSU. Won more national titles. But the, a living legend. Mm-hmm. Who that? Skip Bergman. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, that, was, he, that was a Louisiana thing. You know, so it's okay, you know. He called to talk about Eric. And I told him how great an athlete he was. This. And mm-hmm. I said, but I got another one. I'm a Division three coach talking to <laughs> the greatest Division one coach in America, coaching the Liberty. I said, I got another one that you ought to look at. And he said, ah. <laughs> he said, what's his name? I said, Billy Wagner. I said, Billy would be a good one uh, to try out. Okay. So he just blew me off about that. So we had three, two guys try out for the United States Olympic team, and Billy Wagner wasn't one of them. The other one was a left handed pitcher, Jimmy Hamilton, four years later. But uh, so Billy gets inducted into the College Baseball Hall of Fame, and they're having it at LSU. So Billy. Flies me down there so I can be with him and, and uh, see the ceremony and whatever. Uh, Mike Martin was in that class from Florida State. Mark Kotze and a couple other guys. But Mark Kotze was a, a teammate, that pretty good reliever in San Diego. What was his name? Trevor Hoffman. Trevor Hoffman. Hoffman. Yeah. 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 Hoffman yeah. was there. But anyway, <laughs> Coach Bergman was there. And I said, Coach, I know you don't remember me. You and I had a conversation about Eric Owens when you were the head coach of the Olympic team. He said, I remember Owens. I said, well, the other guy I recommended was the guy up on the stage who just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Too shy. Oh, yeah. He said, he said, Coach, that ain't the only one I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story. And that's a hell of a place to go into. I mean – because L- oh, what? LSU is, it's they're fanatics. It's you know, I've never seen the, the madness of LSU fans. I, you, it, you're going to struggle to beat that. It, it's I thought Mississippi State was a crazy one down there. I thought they oh, no, they're LSU, all crazy. They're, well, they're all crazy. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's just, just some crazy. No, but yeah. I'll tell you what, when they're winning, LSU, watch out. I mean, they are fanatics. LSU, I, I understand LSU has a tremendous amount of NIL money in baseball. You know, baseball is really booming. College baseball is booming, and and uh, it's money everywhere in college baseball. In Division One, yeah, you know, then Division Two has got one more. Division Three has absolutely no money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> where I where I spent my career, but I, it was it was great. And uh, Eric. Uh, Went in the fourth round with Cincinnati, uh, moved through the minor leagues at a rapid pace, winning some awards and stuff. Then he makes it to the big leagues. Uh, Had a great career, and his teammates loved him. So at that banquet, I go over to introduce myself to Trevor Hoffman. And Billy said some really nice things, but uh, I said, I said, Mr. Hoffman, and I'm older than he is. <laughs> and you just don't do that to a pro. <laughs> but anyway, I said, I want to talk to you about 
Eric Owens, he said, Ebo, my <laughs> favorite teammate. Let's see, they were teammates in San Diego. <clears throat> well, that year, uh, when Eric was there, it was the second last game of the season. They're playing the Dodgers, and it's Eric Owens' night in San Diego. Dirty T-shirt. Dirty oh, T-shirt. Nice. 54,000 people there. And they gave out white T-shirts with Owens with grass stain on it. <laughs> and eye black. Everybody comes to the stage. So there's 80-year-old women with <laughs> eye black on. That's the truth. And white. Sh- <laughs> oh, there it is. No, it's, yep. it's similar, black. but it's a T-shirt. But th- there's the eye black. Well, first in, and he hits a triple, which is, I think, the most exciting mm-hmm. play in, in, in baseball because the home run just gets out there. Sure. Right? And there's 54,000 people waving those. Right on. And you got to earn like, the triple. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was just a special day, and mm-hmm. I was glad I was there. And uh, But he did a lot of a lot of things in the big leagues <laughs> that always got the attention of his teammates. And he won't talk about it, but. I sure well, that's will. a humble I, man. I, I, I sure will. <laughs> but now, with him here <clears throat> and uh, the enthusiasm and passion he has for this place and this program, and, uh, mm-hmm. if it doesn't get him uh, down with <laughs> <laughs> some of the stuff not happening uh, with the snap of a finger, Fast enough. I think he's going to be just outstanding and, and we're going to be able to watch a, a very exciting brand of baseball. You can bet they'll be stealing and hitting and running, mm-hmm. hitting and long ball because I know they're going to hit because yep. Eric's playing career, his professional years didn't stop there. He was the one of the hitting instructors from Toronto won the division. And just to show you that Eric never forgets where he comes from, it was an exciting game. They won it in the, in the bottom of the night. Yep. And uh, they're jumping all around. And I'm sitting there with Casey, my son. And I said, uh, I'm going to text him and say, <laughs> he texts me right back, says cool. he got in the club out. Right on. Cool. I mean, we were watching it live. And uh, that was exciting. But you were a hitting coach there when, like, Bautista and all them were mm-hmm. coming. Let me tell you what. If you were playing daily fantasy back then, you could mm-hmm. win a lot of money. <laughs> oh yeah, by going in and, and what they call it in baseball, it's all it's all different. But I used to jump not as much anymore. But uh, they call it a stack or whatever. So if you could go in there and spend all your money on pretty much everybody one through four, or two through five, or three through six on Toronto, even up to seven some days. If you just got as many of those guys in your lineup as you could, didn't matter where you spent your money anywhere else, just get the biggest bum on the bottom of the list, you could win a lot of money. I remember winning the most. I think I won like. $2,200 one day, all Toronto players in my lineup. <laughs> I mean, they just went out there. Can't, it was, uh, Bautista was one of the, who was the other one? It was Josh Donaldson. Was Josh Donaldson yeah, won the MVP. Right. We had, uh, Evan Encarnacion. Oh, we yeah. called him the quiet assassin. He was the one. He was probably the most consistent one of all of them. He was a beast. Uh, yeah. We had Troy Tula Whiskey. Had him too. Uh, I remember like, we he had was, him. We had him. Uh, he was a, a god yeah. in, in Colorado when he goes out to Toronto. We, just we had Russell Martin. Yeah. I mean, we had some, we had some, we had some dudes that was there, but the, the biggest thing about majority of them, they were ball players mm-hmm. and they wanted to get out there and play every day. And, um, it changed the culture. Even when we got David Price over there from Detroit, it really, and him and Tula Whiskey really changed the, um, the culture of the, uh, of the clubhouse. We were around 500 and, uh, when it's, we traded for Tulo, and we got a guy that could catch a ball shortstop. Jose Reyes was a great ball player, but, it, I mean, he was just a liability at short at that time in his career. So we got somebody that could catch a ball. And we got David Price, and David Price bought every single person, trainers, coaches, everybody robes and stuff like that, put their names on it and all that stuff. And it was like Louis Vuitton robes. I mean, it was like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> but, I mean, that's the thing. It's, young it's, it's, right yeah, there. right. It was just, I mean, it was just a great, great uh time uh came up uh as i'm gonna say once i got done with my career i came up with the angels as a coach and i had the likes of mike trout and those guys at 17 years old and then i went over to the dodgers and i had Corey seager and those guys and they won a world series so i've been around a lot of good players and uh and then going over to the blue jays and, and making it as a coach and as a player is pretty special i mean did, did you catch tony gwynn while you were in san, san diego san, was tony gwynn was my yeah he was he was he, i mean abe got to talk to him and me and tony tony didn't 
didn't talk to a lot of people, but he loved yeah. me. We used to sit on the plane together. Now that we're here in Rocky Mountain, we uh, he went. He doesn't drink very much, but he loved to drink a little bit of moonshine every now and cool. again on a, on a plane. He was in the Rock County. Oh, right. He he would he would have a little sip or two, and he would start talking baseball. And to hear him talk hitting, and I told Abe's story. I said uh, we were playing the Mets, and uh, outlighter on me. I was like three for thirty <laughs> off of him. I wasn't That's striking okay. out against him. I just couldn't get him off of me. He threw that cutter in at ninety four miles an hour. So I was three for 30 off of him career. And I think it was two doubles and a home run. And uh, so I let off the game. We had a day game in San Diego and I hit a double down uh, the left field line. And Tony comes up and he ends up striking out. And which was like, I mean, the sky's falling. You know, this doesn't oh, yeah. happen. Yeah, right. And it's like, Oh yeah. my word. Nobody say a word. Everyone hold your breath. And so I'm out in the outfield throwing to him in between games. He goes, E, if this guy throws me a breaking ball, my next at bat, I'm going to hit a home run. He never talked about hitting home runs. And I'm sitting there and it, it really bothered me because I'm sitting there during the whole inning. I didn't con- I'm, thank God whoever we had pitching did not hit a ball center field because it started messing with me. I'm going, I'm sitting there replaying his at bat going, this guy didn't even throw you a breaking ball. I don't understand what you're talking about right now. He was sitting. And then the next at bat, he throws a first pitch break. Well, he hits a home run. And I'm like, wait a minute. This guy is way (laughs) out of my league. I I don't even know what we do with this. But I mean, that's just, that's how his mind worked. And he Mm -hmm. understood. He understood his swing. I mean, and he was, uh, what a great teammate. And I mean, he would talk to everybody, uh, about hitting. And a lot of people didn't, uh, uh, didn't agree with him and stuff like that. But for me, I mean, I know Pete Rose. Um, Pete Rose is my hero growing up in Cincinnati because, I mean, I was a Cincinnati Mm -hmm. Reds fan. But uh, Tony Gwynn is the best singles hitter that's ever lived. I mean, it didn't matter. I mean, when you hit what he did off Greg Madison, you look at his strikeout numbers. I mean, there's guys striking out like in a year and a half in the big leagues right now, what he did in 22 years of playing in the big leagues. Um, There's a video that goes around now. You might see it on social media every now and then, and it says that Greg Maddox, uh, John Smoltz, and Pedro Martinez, something like ungodly amount of strikeouts, so how that add up. And between the three of them, they only struck out Tony Gwynn three times, mm-hmm. and and one of them did it twice. So that means one of them. I think Greg Maddox never got a strikeout against Tony Right. It was probably Pedro. It was probably Pedro because he just didn't see Pedro as much, um, to be honest with you. But, uh, I mean, he could just flat out hit. And, I mean, everyone used to talk about my size and how big I was. And a lot of coaches wanted me to hit for more power. And Tony's the one that really got me to stay with my game plan of being able to use my speed and hit the ball the other way and, and, and play good defense. And there's a place for you to play. And, you know, you're trying to hit for power and you're striking out and you're not, you know, you're hitting 10 home runs a year. That's not really helping your career. I mean, you're not, you got to hit 30 plus to be able to, to hit. Nowadays, you can hit, you know, 20 plus and hit 200. I would be scared for my job nowadays, but these guys are keeping them nowadays. And yeah, it's a shame to see all these strikeouts that are happening. Game's changed. <clears throat> what, what do you think that is? Well, just going for the power hit or? I yeah, mean- I think a lot of them are, are, are trying to do, uh, um, they're trying to hit for power. They're trying to go for numbers. But if you always look at it every year, just like I said, if you watch like Bruce Bochy was my manager in Texas when it last year, Texas was the best situational hitting team. You had Seager, you had those guys, uh, Marcus Simeon. They they, they don't strike out during the playoffs. And I mean, so they're very aggressive and, and they get it done. I mean, still to this day, if you play for your numbers um, during the season, then they start playing for the team in the, in the, in the playoffs. Right. But the problem is, can you flip that switch? Can you be able to, like when I when I was with the Blue Jays, everyone would play Josh Donaldson, Batista, and Encarnacion. They'd play the shift on them when it was legal, and they would just hit a ball right to the second baseman during the playoffs. But during the season, they didn't care. I mean, and I get it. I mean, they're they're that's their livelihood. They're trying to get the ball in the air and, and hit home runs. But nowadays, uh, you know, pitchers are, are supposedly throwing harder, and they got all these metrics and stuff out there, and these hitters, and uh, it's just, uh, you know. Sometimes I think it's a lot of uh, outside voices that are that are happening in, in in professional baseball. So, you know, I mean, the strikeouts were up and nobody cares, and that's the thing is nobody really cares. Uh, you look at Javier Baez from Detroit. Mm. I mean, this guy has God bless him. I mean, I, I'm not mad at anyone in this world that can do it, but he stole money. Uh, and he hasn't made an adjustment in four years. And I mean, Detroit's had to bite on this for a while. And so, you know, that's where you got to do your homework on kids and, and you got to be able to see what they're really into. Cause like a Corey Seager plays with slow heart, but Corey Seager's the same Corey Seager that was in double A. Uh, for us or or able he's the same header he's more intelligent but same same type of guy so when, when you're presented with a selection a selection conundrum how are you how are you picking the guy that 
has the stats. I, I just, I'm intrigued as to what what you're seeing that somebody else isn't. Well, a lot of it is uh, for me, especially in baseball, is how do they handle failure? Uh, that's the trick. That's the is like you, you, you know you got to understand they can handle success, but like for me to be able to move a guy when I was with the Dodgers from A ball double A, I need to know that he could handle the failure. I knew if he succeeded, it was good. But if he could handle failure, and if he and if he didn't make the situation bigger than what it was, and he could slow his heartbeat down, and and you could tell that he was still confident out there. Right then you know that they're good, right? I want to see a guy, and that's what Bruce Mochi taught me. This is what I'm going to bring here. I'm going to treat every kid. Hey, I get it. It's still a tough game. As as I saw today on Facebook somewhere, I think it was Willie Stargell said that you know they, they got a round ball and you got a round bat and you're trying to hit it square and you're trying to define physics. So you, you can't oh, you can't forget how hard the game is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to be more on the, um, the uh, fundamental side and the mental side of it. We can't have mental lapses because you can control that. You can't control if you're getting hits or not, you can hit the ball as hard as you, you know, you hit the ball on the nose four times, get nothing out of it. Uh, and but you got to be able to handle that part of it, knowing that it, eventually it's going to turn around for you. And that's the hardest thing because you know, when you're not stepping the batter's bus, and uh, as Abe said, I like it now, and that's what you do as a player, you worry about yourself, and as a, as a coach, you worry about everyone but yourself. So yeah. that's how it goes. That, that's always been the challenge, though, is being able to come from behind, um, with integrity because a, a lot of folks can, can collapse in that situation they they've something's happened that's turned the game whether it's the crowd or an early score or a lazy score and it's it just takes the wind out of the the whole team um and and that to me that's when you need your star players to really stand up to the plate well, baseball, everybody looks at it and watches it on TV thinks it's a slow game. If you really know the game, it's a really fast game. And uh, when momentum starts to shift in baseball, you're, you you're not, you're it. not, you're not, it's hard to get it back. Yeah. Right. So that's where you see it like in the playoffs. It's, it's, it's like, it's a free for all. And it's even like in college baseball, we had great teams and it doesn't matter. You, you can get in the playoffs, but it, anyway, once you get to that point, you run into a hot team. It's like we had the best team in Toronto in 2015. There's no question in my mind. We, we, we would have won the World Series. We ran into a really hot Kansas City World Series. They were team. just on it. David Price had retired 18 or 19 guys in a row. We drop a pop up in between Batista and uh, Ryan Goins. Momentum shifted. They scored yep. four times that inning, and we never got it back. We came back the next day. We we battled, but that the series was pretty much over. So that's where we were. Um, you know, that's that's what you're you're trying to look for. And you're trying but, to find someone who can change the momentum for yeah, your team. Recognizing that dip, um, and then being able to forcefully come back from from that position mentally is is the biggest challenge, I think semi-professional professional players have is to get out of that hole well the the biggest thing in baseball is you play you play a lot more and i played them both but you play a lot more than football so if you have a tough loss of football you got a week to be able to get it out of your mind and get ready to go again and get going whereas and, and you look at the nfl a lot of these guys i, I was seeing with the kansas city chiefs either this year or last year their schedule was so brutal they would play like a sunday thursday then they because they were prime time and then they play like a, a christmas and play a thir- it was then they did one in europe somewhere yeah, yeah. i mean that, so, that's just madness yeah. why so, would you what, what would you put your I mean, players through that and i think you know yeah, what would you send anybody to england mm-hmm. And I think, you know, <laughs> the thing is, is uh, the quarterback is Patrick Mahomes and his favorite sport was baseball growing up. And that's where he, he, you can tell that he has that baseball mentality, even out on the football field. And John Elway got drafted. And, and so you got a lot of guys that were quarterbacks that play baseball and understand how to handle failure. Peyton Manning, I'm sure played baseball growing up and, and Eli and those guys, but you can just tell the difference of these guys and, and their mentalities. Cause baseball mentality is the only sport that you could play and fail and still succeed. You, you, know, you hit 400, you're out six times, and you're still, but you're out. You're out six times. Right. If you're missing someone as a quarterback, that means you're not going to be quarterback very long. If you're missing free throws, unless you're Shaquille O'Neal, uh, you're you're not going to be playing basketball either. Right. Well, I mean, I remember some of the best games, some of the best games of rugby. Sorry to bring it up. Some of the best games that I remember, going back, you know, 25 years, are the games that we lost, but we lost well, and and that's that's. That that to me is that's how that's how to well, play the game. That's how to play the game when you lose. Well, and one thing you touched on in terms of uh, the way the game has changed. You know, I grew up in the '90s uh, with baseball. You know, in the forefront there, and 
it wasn't analytical as it is now. How much do you think analytics and the focus on analytics has changed the game overall? It's Good killed question. it. Good okay. question. Uh, that's the reason why I was pretty much let go in Toronto because I, I had the younger kids really. I mean, there was two of us there, uh, but they wanted to go. They didn't believe in two hitting coaches, but we just made the playoffs twice and we got to the ALCS once. And we got, I mean, we, we got through to, uh, one round into Cleveland until we lost and they played in the World Series. And they, they just said that they were more into the analyticals and uh, this guy's going to be fired at the end of the year. I mean, he should have been fired two years ago. The problem is, I think it's a happy balance of it. I mean, mm-hmm. I think there's certain things that you can take out of it, but you it can't seems to be top heavy now. Yeah, though. but you can't take a picture out of the game. If you watch Bruce Bochy and Dusty Baker, they didn't. Mm-hmm. They went with right. their gut and you get them to the sixth, seventh inning, they're going to win that ball game. I mean, the only way they lose it is if the pitcher messes it up or somebody messes up, but they're going to push the right buttons to have those guys succeed. And so you can look at the, uh, I, you can look at all these guys. Um, yeah, you know, no computer is going to tell me when I can look out there and see a human mm-hmm. being out there. It's going to tell me when I need to take this guy out. You can look at them and tell by their body language and things like that is how things are going. How many stressful innings mm-hmm. have they had? You know, I mean, are they? Is there a guy on second base every inning? This guy's not going to be out there very long because I mean, right. it's just stressful innings. If he's if he's getting guys on first base and throwing double play balls and he's not getting a lot of guys in scoring position, then you can push him a little bit longer because uh, he's not really as stressful innings. For me, it's more about stressful innings. And that's where I think arm injuries come in too is, you know, you're putting a kid out there and he's throwing 40, 50 pitches in an inning. I mean, you got to think, I mean, this is, you know, that's that's because in the big leagues, even these are grown men, you get a guy at 30, 35 pitches in an inning, the starter, they're getting somebody up in the bullpen and they're not letting him go that much longer because you can't, you're, you're killing them. Right. Then you're killing him for his next start. So you got to realize you got to balance that. And that's the biggest thing, even though I'm an offensive guy, it's, the, it's, it's handling the pitching staff and, and understanding what they can do and what they can't do and trying to put them in the best position to succeed. Well, it seems like, what are you hiring a manager for, but to make those decisions? And it seems like analytics sort of defeats that purpose. A lot of them go in uh, and I know the guy with the blue Jays, he goes in, they give him a piece of, of paper so it's all scripted before the game starts whereas when i was it was some in there but um and i like i like john gibbons a lot and that was uh, my big league experience is like if we're winning the game today this is who we're bringing in and uh, whether it be the sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth and if we're losing the game we're gonna get this guy some innings because he needs to get some innings in and hopefully we can get back out there and then we can kind of you know develop you know you want to develop three or four guys that you can really count on mm-hmm. towards the end of the season and that's what bruce bochy did last year some in the playoffs the same guys came out every single game when they had the lead he would give guys some innings when they didn't have the lead and hopefully that they can hold them down and give them some confidence so i don't i mean the metrics are great but i mean like metrics for me go out the window when the playoffs start because you're looking at human beings out there and so i mean it it, is i think everything is good in in moderation and i think a lot of teams do it right and i think a lot of teams do it wrong Mm Moneyball changed everything. It's just hard for me to to trust someone who who's never stepped in a buyer's box mm-hmm. before to tell me when I need to pull a guy out of the game or something like that. It's just tougher. I mean, I get it. They they have a place for everything, but and that's nothing against anybody. I mean, there's plenty of guys out there that's coached before that didn't play in the big leagues or anything like that. I'm not saying a big league guy, but uh, you know, you can make a guy from Harvard that's graduated with a uh, a physics degree mm-hmm. or something. He's trying to tell me when I'm going to pull this guy out of the game. It's going to be very hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me to to accept that and knowing that i mean this guy is rolling right now why am i letting him right yeah but you know the numbers say get him out of there i'm like no let's push him another inning because every inning you can push your starter is a less inning that you're passing your bullpen out when you play like that too when you play solely off analytic it almost makes it a simulation you know what i mean that's basically what it is it's like well this is what's going to happen and this is what needs to happen Mm -hmm. you know the 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 best thing about baseball, the most awesome thing about baseball is the people who step up when you least expect it. When the thing happens, when you had no idea, you know, when somebody goes out there for that extra in and because the coach saw something in them or somebody goes up to bat who hadn't, you know, hit jack shit off a pitcher and drills one over the center field wall, you know, those like analytics can't can't call for those moments. And we probably, you know, if we had analytics throughout the history of time, how many moments would have you lost? I mean, analytics were probably taking away the called shot by Babe Ruth, you know? I mean, it just, when you think back, it's wild to to kind of see what we're at with the game and how things are being portrayed. It sounds like they're using analytics to predetermine the outcome of the game. And that to me is a disastrous concept because it's down to the individual player and his skill set and and mind gain in 
how he perceives it. So if he's in the right mindset, don't let ana- analytics ride him out. Well, do they use analytics as well as more of a um, kind of the insurance policy? Because I don't know if it's like this for baseball, but you see it in football and, and a lot of things, uh, and a lot of sports. They even help for the military. You know, they look at you as government property. If you're a soldier, if you don't get a tattoo, or you get syphilis from the base, you know, the, the stripper joint right off base, <laughs> then, you know, the, the government's going to come after you. I was in the military. I mean, these are just <laughs> stories I heard. So. Uh-huh. Um, Allegedly. That's <laughs> beautiful. But d- does... Do do baseball <laughs> players and managers and organizations they kind of look like their players as a big time investment? As I know they do, but as much as like the NBA to would to where hey analytics says we need to pull him out now because his arm might go or something like that. Is that is that any kind of part of it as well? Well, you look at it and you look at the NFL football because I watch that a lot too, and and even in college, well, college has always done it a little bit more than the NFL. But the analytics has helped them go on fourth downs a lot now. Instead of kicking field goals, you can see what they're saying. The analytics says does do this, and they do it. Um, I mean, I get that, but baseball is, uh, like I said, I mean, you can look out there uh, for me is you're taking the human element out of it. Just like, you know, even though I, I don't like any of them umpires at all, uh, but, but you're taking, <laughs> oh, the well hu- said. <laughs> but you're taking the, you're taking the human element out of it. And for them to go to robots and, and stuff like that, that's taking the human element out yeah, of I it. Like it. And I, I mean, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather see, you know, I hate to say it. I'd rather see managers get thrown out of games and, and not that they, they, they're not trying to miss calls out there. And that's a hard thing to do anyway to begin with. But, uh, and then you get to the best. But I mean, it's got to be, you know, there should be times, I think, in the playoffs that you should be able to challenge a ball or strike if it, because it, it could change momentum again. Very and the thing much. that we can't do and metrics can't do, and this is what I, I mean, there's all kinds of things I could talk to you guys about what I want to master, like timing and stuff like that before I leave this earth is no one ever talks about, teaching adrenaline right so you know if you're pricing at 100 percent, what are you going to do when adrenaline kicks in you're going to i mean there's not more you're going to play probably with your hair on fire whereas i'd like to see practice at 70 percent, so that i know the other 30 percent is going to come when the game starts so no one ever talks about coaching adrenaline and that's what i want to bring in here is for kids to be able, be able to play with a slow heartbeat like i said you don't see Corey seager or mike trout panicking you don't see any any of these Tom, Tom Brady, you think he panicked when they were down? He never panicked. He knew that what he was doing, and he had a game plan, and he did it. And that's what you want these guys to do is to play free and play with a slow heartbeat because your practice is where you want them to fail. You don't want them to fail in the game. And let me ask you one last question on the analytics. Uh, we've got this phenom, Paul Skeens, pitcher for the, the Pittsburgh uh, Pirates, uh, just dominating every starting uh, uh, game. Uh, or every game he starts. So he has a no-hitter, I think, through seven innings, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, and his uh, manager pulled him. Would you have made that same call? You mean um, Paul that plays for Pittsburgh Yankees? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's only a couple years the away. National League. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. The National League. Yep. He's only a couple years away from being <laughs> oh, yeah, a Yankee. Exactly I can right. promise you there's, that. There's no <laughs> Or he's, no, he's no, not going to be the, there. You're exactly like, right. He's on the. You know what? There, there's there's times out there, and I would say I was a part of uh, AJ Burnett. He threw. He came off the disabled list. We're gonna say actually, I got traded to Florida Marlins for Mark Casse. So when we went back to San Diego and played them that year, AJ Burnett came off the disabled list, and he threw a 125 pitch, and he pitched a no hitter, but he walked like five guys. He hit a couple guys. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, and Derek Shelton, their manager, is a very good friend of mine. So I'm sure there's something behind it, to be honest with you. Yeah, you want to protect these guys. I don't know how much you can protect them. I mean, you look at Nolan Ryan and them. They're all going to – I mean, you could, I, I look at his arm action. It does hurt my arm to see the way that he throws it. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that they have a little bit more – uh, intel with that and also they're probably you know they're in the playoff race too so mm-hmm. he's probably on an innings limit because he well, just came out of college so he's probably going to be they're probably trying to save innings for the playoffs because if you don't uh, you're running out is- of innings with this kid they're saying and they, no one's got it right mm-hmm. i mean you know they say we're going to limit this guy to 150 and uh julio uh urias uh he doesn't pitch anymore for the dodgers but we had him as a 16 year old mexican and he threw he would throw 80 innings a year uh, tops for three years 
years until he, you know, got 19, 20 years old. But then by the time he's in big leagues, now he could throw a hundred innings. So they all got this stuff, but he still had arm surgery, I think. So I don't think it's any, any, there's no right or wrong reason. I think the problem is, is there's so much torque on the arm and kids are throwing so much harder nowadays and everybody's throwing max effort. There's no, mm-hmm. there's nobody out there like Greg Mattis where it's fluid and that ball is just sinking and it's cutting and darting and here and there. They're just mm-hmm. letting this thing fly as long as they can, as hard as they can. And your body just can't take it, right? So, you know, they're just, they're out there. So, Skeen's just throwing 100 miles an hour, and, and that's great. But, I mean, what happens in, you know, three or four years? And I hope nothing happens. Sure. Soon. But if you look at Chris Sale, oh, Chris sure. Sale was one. It. He threw so many innings for the White Sox back in the day. And he got hurt with Boston. Mm-hmm. Now he's back. He's finally back with, and he was, I think he was an all-star with the the Braves. So, mm-hmm. it's just, it's, a, it's there again. I still think it's better to look at a guy with the, with your naked eyes, and that's mm-hmm. what you want to call mm-hmm. it, and look and see how many stressful innings are you putting this kid through i mean if he's if he's out there struggling and he's walking people and it's i mean those pitch counts are getting up there you know you got 100 pitches in five innings that's that's not that's not getting through a game that's you're suffering through that game so you got to kind of keep an eye on it but you know what it's going to happen at some point in time i mean we talk about billy billy uh he's pretty impressive uh being at um uh where he's at at miller school uh he told me the other day he said he's been there for i think 10 years now because will uh came through there and he started coaching there well, he had to be 10 years because he's about my age and he says he's never had an arm problem there so we're going to actually mm, this might get me in trouble at fair college we're going to take their arm care program mm-hmm. that he has because it's worked i mean i'm like hey that's amazing to be able to say you haven't had anybody yeah. have arm problems it's so, that, that age and level of. exactly so we're going to take whatever he's doing and we're going to con- try to impl- implement it in here and uh, we'll give it to uh, strength conditioning people whoever wants to run over but this is a program we're going to run um, and, not, and it's not my program but I mean it's something that works you want to try to use sure. it that makes a lot of sense yeah it's wild I'm glad he kind of brought up a, a little bit ago the, uh, the, uh, the Royals there and I know you was talking about that year they ended up beating you for anybody that that doesn't really watch baseball or pay attention, that's something I, in my opinion, I would suggest go look into and kind of watch that path. And and maybe I'm wrong about it, but you somebody who's kind of watched it. I mean, they were so low budget and just so manufactured. Like watch them in the playoffs, and I remember driving over the road and listening to the games on the radio. You know, like we did back in the '40s. You know, when Abe was playing ball. Um, <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> that was for you, Carter. I forgot that uh, joke he <laughs> let off before. But I mean, but but watch them. They they didn't have a they didn't have a massive uh, roster as far as uh, big talents concerned. You know, um, they weren't supposed to win. They weren't supposed to even be there. They weren't supposed to be anywhere on the field. They were supposed to be at the bottom of the division, like they are every single year. And somehow, I guess it was Yost. I guess is he that good of a coach to be able to, or, or did they just get get hot? I mean, what was it that was so special about that team? You know, majority to, of them came up through the minor leagues together. You look at Hosmer. He was when I saw Hosmer in Double A. I said, "This is the best hitter I've ever seen before in my life." Uh, that was early before I saw Seager. And, I mean, Mike Trout is Mike Trout. I mean, healthy Mike Trout's an MVP, but Corey Seager is the best hitter I've ever coached or been around. Uh, his his mind works. I mean, like it's unbelievable how it works. But they had Mustakas play third base. They had uh, the shortstop. They all kind of came up together, and they got a, they had a really 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 good bullpen. And I mean, you get those starters like they had uh, they had um, some starters that would go four innings, and then they had like they had their bullpen set up, and they would go and you go short series like that. We say short series seven games, but yeah, you're getting like when we played Cleveland, they would bring in Miller, the lefty that threw ninety. Six ninety seven miles an hour from from three quarters, and he was six seven. Uh, he was filthy, and I mean, it was like you know, you're going to get him for three innings, and I mean, you're probably not scoring. So the biggest thing in those type of series is get the lead early. And what we did in Cleveland that we lost, and it's amazing how much you can remember. Is uh, even a, a love to death. Josh Donalds is on first base in the first inning, and Marco Estrada's pitching for us. He had a Bugs Bunny changeup, and uh, he threw like eighty nine, but he threw like a sixty eight mile an hour changeup that people could not see and so josh donaldson is on first base and carnacion hits the ball off the right center field wall well donaldson does a secondary lead and he pauses i mean it's like it's two outs and so it ends up being second and third batista strikes out it should have been one nothing we end up losing that game one nothing 
Yeah. And so wow. you never know, especially uh, in a ball game, when when you can lose a game. That's why a lot of people go, oh, yeah, this guy made an error. He struck out the bases loaded with the game on the line or whatever. The game was on the line maybe in the first inning. You never know. You got to, you, you know, you can, you, so I don't ever want to blame, you can't point fingers at Joey because Joey struck out in, in the seventh inning and we lost a game then. We probably lost a game somewhere along the way in the second, third, fourth innings and stuff like that. And I think the more you get educated about it as a ball player, the more you quit pointing fingers and you start taking blame and you go, you know, I should have got this guy in the second inning. And that's where you educate these kids so they can still play, but understanding that just because you threw the, you know, you throw a home, you know, you, we lost the game on a home run in the bottom of the ninth. That doesn't mean that that's where we lost the game at. You lose the game, and we lose as a team, we win as a team. So you lose the game probably somewhere else along the way. Well, I think that's kind of wild you said, and, and to talk about longevity and all coming up together and playing together and stuff, we don't think about that anymore. Lorenzo Cain played right, our center. I mean, they were, they, they all played. They yeah, all you played. You the guys that could play any position Absolutely. on the mm-hmm. field. You know, you, mm-hmm. and, and I guess kind of segueing into you being here at Ferrum now, you want to talk about longevity. That's something you have an opportunity here. You know, you have an opportunity to get people here for three or four years. You know, I remember, do you remember Bridgewater College in like 2000 going to the national title game in football mm-hmm. and going against Mount Union? And I mean, they gave Mount Union all they could handle. And Mount Union is just a, you know, just a factory. Mm-hmm. And and I'm pretty sure the coach, he got up there and he just started out and said, all right, look, I'm playing all freshmen this year. I don't care what grade you are. You're a junior, senior, sophomore. I apologize to you. And by the time those guys got to be seniors, we made it all the way. And we're a field goal away because Kelly Moore played on that team. You know, he went to Frank County High mm-hmm. School. And and uh, I remember going to that game or watching it on TV. And so longevity coming together and, and they about – bring you in on this because you've had a lot of teams over the years and can kind of talk on how staying together and coming up and, and getting that really helps and, and how that's probably going to be something you're using here moving forward. Well, and Eric, well, every coach does it their own way. And, and I had a way, mine was old school way. And our teams were probably close together because they had a common enemy, me. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> it brings the team together. That'll do but, it. Uh, you know, that nothing ever uh, takes a place of a compliment and a pat on the back, letting your players know that you care about them as human beings, not only as a shortstop or second base pitcher or whatever. And to pass a test of time, you have to get that across that you do care about your players. Because once they understand that, you can coach them about any way you want to coach them. And, uh, and coaching is, is motivation, and you mo- you can't motivate them all the same way. Some of them need a pat on the back. Some of them need a kick in the rear end. Honey and vinegar. Mm-hmm. Honey and vinegar. Yeah. And uh, it's and then, if you know, once Eric is here a while, he's developed a culture, and the seniors, the juniors, and seniors, the upperclassmen, take care of a lot of the discipline problems, and the captains of the team tell the young ones what you can do and what you can't do, or what you better not do, and and Eric gets to work on baseball fundamentals and, mm-hmm. and uh, preparing his team on how to <laughs> beat the opponent, and. uh it's so exciting uh, just to be around Eric. Uh, his phone is ringing off the hook because of all of his connections, all of Billy Wagner's connections, not just between Wadesboro and Endicott. I'm talking about all over mm-hmm. the country, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And they're calling him from Florida to from Boston, Oklahoma, Texas. Or they're getting calls from all over the country. They don't know where Ferrum is, but they know where Eric Owens is. And that's there, all that matters. There we that's go. the connection. They know yep. that Billy Wagner played here. Right. And, and he'll be a future Hall of Famer. And, and it's so exciting to me that the alumni are just buying into it, mm-hmm. the excitement. They're, they're recommending uh, high school players to come here now, and uh, that wasn't happening enough for them to be successful in the past few years. But uh, it's going to be – Fun to watch. It's going to be some growing pains, but it's going to be exciting. Yeah, there's new energy. I mean, you, you can you can tell it. Uh, it's new energy at the college, mm-hmm. and this is a great place. It's important to Franklin County. It's important to the state of Virginia. Uh, 
it's important to the region. That's, you know, Patrick County, that's where I'm from. It, it brought me up here. That's how we got to meet. Exactly. I just had a kid from Patrick County come back yesterday. Tal Swells actually was in my uh, uh, coach's office yesterday. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. They they had some real studs yeah, on that team. I played against Brad Klontz and those oh, yeah. guys. I was, in, okay. I was in that yep. era. But to answer your question, too, like Abe said, is I'm not afraid to play freshman. I think when I came here, um, my first year here, uh, it, at the beginning, okay, but within two weeks of the season, I played short. Chris Hope played second. Gerald Smith played right. Jeff, or I'm sorry, first base. Jeff Smith, uh, well, at the beginning played third. He ended up being DH. And then we had Jeremy Hill that went to JUCO with me. So we had four or five freshmen. So to answer your question is, I don't care. I mean, if you're better than a junior or senior, you're going to play. Strap I mean, that's, it just, on. that's just the way it goes. And I think the more that you do that, the more that you, you start building uh, confidence in mm-hmm. guys. And I mean, you don't want to, I mean, look, we don't want to go out there and do that, but uh, we came up together and like my last year, we we're 25 and 0 to start with. And that's because we'd all played together and we ended up leading, which I, I didn't really realize until I got back here. We led all division three in fielding percentage. And everybody wants to talk about the hitting and pitching, but we led division three in fielding. And that's for me, when you catch a ball, and even though I come from the offensive side of the ball, if you can throw a ball across the plate and catch the ball, you're going to win a lot of games that you shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, and you're not walking guys. You're going to win a lot of games that you shouldn't be winning. And especially, uh, I'm bringing in the base running thing. I think base running is the one of the least amount of things that are taught in baseball. And uh, I'm not going to run these guys. And I've told them before, I'm not going to run them around campus and stuff like that. If they're going to get punished, they're going to run bases so we can be the best base running team in the country. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that we're not going to run them until they drag their tongue on the ground. That just means that we're going to run bases. And they don't learn how to run bases because that's what we need to do is we need to be the best base running team. So if we can do stuff like that, we're going to beat teams that, that – we shouldn't be beating. And, uh, we, you know, if we can get in those one run games and win a lot of the one run games early, uh, we're going to build confidence. I mean, you know, what I want to do is not, not have a, not have a point to where, you know, everyone's putting their head down after five games, mm-hmm. six games. We want to be able to be in these ball games and, and make sure the other team knows that they were in a, um, a dog fight to, for the whole entire nine innings. And once the game's over with, we'll let the chips fall where they may. And you, you talk about teaching them running. I mean, who better to teach them than Eric Owens? <laughs> well, I was I, I was the Angels base running outfield uh, and hit, assistant hitting coordinator, and I did, actually was asked to do it with the Dodgers too. So I did a lot of it, and we're gonna we're gonna learn how to cut bases. It's just like if you're running from home to second, there's 180 feet uh, between home plate and second base, so you you can't run in a straight line because obviously you got to make the bow out. But we're gonna make that bow out. We call it the home run alley. Is mm-hmm. you get out early and you're gonna cut first base. So by the time you hit first base, you're in as much direct line as second base. You might watch, watch Mike Trout run bases still this mm-hmm. day he's in as a much direct line to second base and if it's a triple you bow back out home run alley and you cut you lean and snap your head and stuff like that so you're understanding a lot of guys will watch the baseball when he hit first base and they'll hit out to right center field now they're running 210 feet mm-hmm. opposed to i got a i got a carter chitwood that's running 190 feet he's gonna beat him mm-hmm. and so i'm just saying that's what it, that's how it happens that's a good bait mark trombo was one of the best base runners i ever had and you would never think of that. Uh, cause, power guy, yeah, very power guy, first baseman, but he could run bases. He could cut corners. And he, he's he, like he said, he goes, I don't want to run more than 190 <laughs> feet anymore. He goes, I said, I don't blame it. He goes, I like to run all the way around and jog, but if I have to run them, I want to cut these corners so I don't have to run as far. Shortest distance. Yeah, That's the right. shortest between. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to do a lot of that stuff. And, you know, for me, uh, there are no singles in baseball out of the batter's box. Yeah. You know, it's a double until they stop you. And then that's what they're going to do. And it's going to be a lot of uh, growing pains with this, but we're hoping the fall is going to take care of a lot of this stuff because, uh, yeah, this hustle factor for me, as, as if you can look at my career, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're, it's no, there's no singles in this game at Barron College. It's doubles until they stop you. That's a great I do, I do like your concept of merit over position. If you're hot, you're playing. Yeah. Regardless. And that's about merit. That's how it should be. Yeah, I mean, the best is going to play. It'd be like bringing up a Corey Seager and, or Mike Trout and, and not letting them play, right? If this guy's better than what we have here, and it, my job as a coach is to find better players than what I have. Their job is to, to not m- let me find them. And that's, and it. that's, 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 it's, the it's to be game. off that right. Yeah, I'm going to tell them yeah. day one. My job is to go find someone better than you. And you know what? 
If you show me that I can't find someone better than you, and then you get to play. I mean, that's how it is in this game of baseball, yeah. especially now with the transfer portals and stuff. Um, you know, we're, I mean, it's a, it's a different, it's a different animal out there, but still this day, I'd rather go. Yeah. I, do you want to plug in holes with the transfer portal? But I still, I'm still a little bit of the old school. I like to have that, that young kid coming out of high school who's green and I can help. And he, I know that he's going to be loyal to Ferrum College and nice we're going to be loyal to him. We can kind of develop him along the way. Um, you know, just grab, yes, if you need a piece or pitching or whatever, yeah, I get that. I transfer a portal, but I still want to do the old school way. Yeah. I've been to Charlotte. I've been to Lynchburg. I've been to Salem. I've been to Covington and I've only been here about three and a half weeks. And, uh, so I've been to four different places in, in this amount of time. And we got some new guys coming in right now. We're trying to get through admissions and stuff like that. So we got like, uh, five guys right now and we'll probably have seven total new guys since I got here. That's trying to, we're trying to get into school school here are, right on. are right your on. transfer rules the same for division one as they are too are they identical there it's it's actually this it's pretty well besides division three you can't give them money really right but yeah it's the same i mean you know it's just a matter you know you're not going to compete with tennessee who's going to give a guy half a million dollars or mm-hmm. whatever it is but yeah you can you can still get down the lines and at the end of the day it's just it, you know you just do numbers together right i mean whereas you're like you're looking at the what, top 10 20 guys that are in the transfer portals getting all the money mm-hmm. and the rest of them are just out there trying to look for money and they ended up i think it was over six thousand guys in the transfer portal this year mm-hmm. and a lot of them are going to end up right back where they're at but yep. now you're starting to burn bridges i mean how much mm-hmm. does the coach want you back how much loyalty did you show mm-hmm. and to get out there so um we're at Fairham college we're looking for those virginia tech players that are want to get to the transfer portal that's not playing <laughs> Uh, you there know, you somebody, go. I'm just being like yep. somebody who's can't pitch for Virginia Tech could probably pitch here for Farron College. And, mm-hmm. and that's what you're looking for. And if they fair year, they're a year and that's so be it. But you know, the kids that you recruit, you hope that you keep. Mm-hmm. And the kids that come out of transfer portal, you know, you're trying to win. That's how, that's the only way we're going to be honest with you. That's the only way we're going to be able to compete at mm-hmm. the uh, division two level coming from this to division two is we're going to have to use a lot of transfer portal and pitchers and things like that. Position player wise, you can kind of make the adjustment. The pitching it's going to be a little bit better, but it's not, it's, you know, velocity is not that big. We, I can help the, the hitting side of it, but we're going to have to plug some holes on the pitchers and, and be able to get in the transfer portal and find some guys who have one year left or two years left. But, you know, we got to, you know, everybody looks for pitching, right? But well, that would be what we're looking for. And you can see where people would want to come to this. I mean, they could come here and make a name for themselves where they might not at a bigger school or not get that play in time and then get the coaching from you as well. Well, that's what we're hoping, you know, and I always bring up Billy and, and Abe, uh, I brought him on as as a, a, and I said I wouldn't take this job unless he could come back and be a, I call him a senior advisor. I think I'm making him special, work. special <laughs> senior, you get the senior stuff out of the way. Well, I know you started Medicare last week, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> I know it is. Man, word travels fast. <laughs> <ain't> special <laughs> word travels fast. <laughs> so he said, "Don't laugh." Last week, I didn't laugh. I just waited till we got on the podcast to say. There it. we go. Uh, <laughs> But no, I brought him back. He's out in the chair now. Watch out. Yeah, I brought him back as a special advisor because I this guy has he's meant everything to me in my life, but he's meant everything to Farham College. If you can't if if you think of Hank Norton, you think of Abe Neff and on the baseball side. And that's and everyone that's around here knows that. You think of Virginia Tech, still to this day you think of Frank Beamer. I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and the yeah. football. So it's kinda of hard to to follow those guys' footsteps. But uh we have a great relationship and we talk a lot and I told him I said I did say senior advisor but if he wants to say special assistant or whatever it is and i said at the time i said his, his job was just to make tea times and he could come up and i think i put him a little bit more to work than what he wanted to do right now but you know what he, i know he i know i can see his fire back back in him and i'd see him enjoying it and I, did, I do i lean on him a lot because he's been through a lot and he's done it before, you know, and to not to listen to someone who's done it. I mean, you got to be crazy because I, I mean, I had great coaches. I had, I always talk about Bruce Bochy and Mike Sosha. What great coaches that to be able to ask them questions and Joe Madden and those type of guys. And I, I learned a lot from all of them. And you take a little piece of it all. And I learned a lot from Abe and how he handled us as, as a family. And I mean, we, I mean, it was a base. My parents would hang out, well, not really hang out, but they'd go to ball games with his parents and, and it was just parents were always around and always, and we always knew that we were, we were knit tight 
family here and we we supported football and we're going to bring that back the baseball team supporting the football team this year and then we're going to support the basketball team and they're going to be there for them because that's the way it should be and i think football will come over especially with kevin sherman me and him are teammates that's the way it's got to be here at this college because we're a small college but you know what as a great time little sort of said if everyone's pulling on the same end of the rope you can you can move mountains if you got people on both sides of the road that mount that mountain's going nowhere well, that's the thing about, you know, even if you are getting guys from D1 or, or transfer portal D, whatever the case may be, you know, baseball is one of those sports, probably the only sport in college that it doesn't really matter where you go. You can go pro from any level and you're living proof of it. You know, uh, Billy's living proof of it. You know, all, all these people around here, but very rarely in football, but in baseball. You might go down. You might be one of the best prospects in the country, but your head might not be right. You might go down to D2 or D3 Mm -hmm. and get your fundamentals back, and boom, that's all it really took. So never be discouraged. You know, it's it's not really a step down. In fact, coming to Ferrum, now, you know, you say Abe's a senior – Excuse me, a special advisor. Uh, what, does, does that give him access to the dugout? Because I'm kind of wondering if he's going to be in the dugout making a call and he's going to be over in the corner saying, I want done. He's, he's, he better stay the hell away in game time. He can sit up here and yell all he wants as long as I can't hear him. I'm sure I'm going to have enough people yelling at me during the game. No, you're right, though. That's the thing is um, a lot of times if you look at kids, uh, you know, a lot of them coming out of high school, you even can see it at the lower levels and stuff. Some kids don't go uh, – they don't grow. You know, I came out of high school, hundred. I mean, football and basketball, I liked it much better than baseball, but I was six foot and 160 pounds. And then after my first like fall, I got up to 190 pounds and put on some weight and muscle. And then, so I got faster, I got stronger, I got bigger. So a lot of kids, and even when I was the uh, Dodgers hitting coordinator, you know, we, I really didn't, it didn't phase me if we got a guy out of LSU, if he wasn't in the first couple of rounds, because usually that's what you're getting. Uh, this guy's played in the SEC. This is what you're going to get. Either he's going to make it or he's not making it. A lot of them are just fillers. Whereas you get a Corey Seager out of high school, you can, you know, he's green, but you can develop him. You can develop my, so I always liked young and I didn't really realize it until I got in the coaching side of it. You want a pitcher who's throwing 95 miles an hour, has no idea where it's going because you can help him. I mean, he's showing, as long as he's showing, flashes we call it then you can help them out right i mean you just got to bring them along put them in certain situations so baseball they'll find you if you're good enough and you're dominating they're going to find you uh wherever you're at and i mean and there's enough people uh, such as myself abe billy white there's enough credibility here at this college that if we call somebody and say hey you need to see this guy they're going to come out and see this guy and uh you know like I, me and abe actually was talking earlier is like if the guy is is good uh you know we can have people come out and see him but then it's up to them it's up to the player to whether they like him or if they don't like him uh there's so many um you know things out there now with these websites and things like that where these guys put their stuff on there and it's hard for me to really recruit from a video because you can't see their heart and you can't see their passion so we're doing a lot of these prospect camps and stuff and you can see a kid i mean just i mean i hate to say it probably for me the best hitter ever lived barry bonds never won a world series Mm -hmm. you know very good play, probably the best that's ever played and stepped in batters. He could run, he could hit. There was nothing he couldn't do, uh, but you couldn't win with him. So that's what we want to do is we want to make sure. I mean, I'd rather take a kid that's not Barry Bonds that you can win with and a Darren Erstad when, uh, and the Angels won or Tim Salmon or those guys or Scott Spezio. I mean, that team won it and they had just a bunch of uh, ragtag guys that wanted to play. They were baseball players. And, and so that's what we want. We're looking for. And it takes a special person to play here at Ferrum, to be honest with you. We're not in the middle of a big city. You know, you got to go somewhere to get in trouble uh, unless you're going to go back to your dorm room. I and mean, we got to plenty of trouble here we won't talk about that apes said everything's positive tonight um but there's there's a lot of things that go on i'm just i'm just so glad <laughs> sal's burned down that's that was my main thing when sal's is gone i knew the, i knew the campus would be in a better place <laughs> what great pizza though sal's oh yes yeah. sal's and bowling's hot dogs oh man you can't beat bowling's i was over there earlier Oh, I hate it. So. Yeah, we got Chip coming down to rock him out every he show. He policies now. through every I time. Can't, I can't. He's got an all time stop on his car. So I got to get the it. The GPS is just like takes him straight there. <laughs> stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect your money. And I love those ladies. They're get so nice. Get a double to me. hot dogs and a Corona. <laughs> Have at it. So, how's your first team looking for next year? I mean, y'all young. 
Well, we we got a lot of um, holdovers, right? So um, I think right now we're at 15 newcomers that are coming in, and then we got seven that are in admissions or financial aid, and we got a couple more, uh, seven or eight, that'll be hopefully be in here by the start of the season. And the one thing, again, that I've learned from Abe is that there's a lot of times your <clears throat> fall, fall team's not going to look the same as your spring, gonna be the same spring So what I'm going to uh, try to do is I'm going to let them compete against each other. We're going to drill them, uh, you know, do their fundamentals and stuff early, but let them in squad and let's see hey because i mean there's a couple guys you know that's going to play like baxter hit 400 he almost won the batting title here last year so i'm sure he's going to be in the lineup uh but you want i want these kids to understand that this is new beginnings for them hey you show me that you can play just because you played last year doesn't mean you're right. playing this year and uh we're trying to bring guys in and and this transition into uh division two baseball is is different right so j- just because you came to fair I and mean, you're playing as a freshman by the time you're a junior you may not be the world yeah it could be in a different different space and i mean like, i mean it's not it's not the easiest thing to do in the world but like i said we're trying to find players that are better than you and i mean we're going to a different level and and even in the minor leagues and stuff like that each level uh i always said that the difference of triple a and the big leagues and it took me a minute to figure it out it wasn't like i was uh i made it through the big leagues pretty quickly i didn't stay i'd go up and down up and down up and down is being able to uh control the game and be able to slow the game down and so the game at, at, at Division Two is going to be a little bit faster than Division Three. Division One is a little bit faster than Division Two. Right. So that's where you get the uh, that the Can borderline. You keep but up and keep where, up the yeah, pace. you get you get a kid that's sort of seven uh, that's running seven two sixties or whatever. You can and he can hit. You can probably put him somewhere in Division Three. But you know if he can't have range in the in the infield, then you're you're, you're going to be losing ball games because he doesn't have any range. He doesn't have right. first step quick. He can run seven two, but he better be able to first step quickness. And so you're just looking for better players, and you're you're looking for more pitching. That you know velocity does mean something at this. It doesn't mean everything. Uh, eighty three can look like eighty eight, and ninety five can look like eighty two. I mean, I faced Randy. I didn't mind facing Randy Johnson or Kurt Schilling. You give me those bowling ball guys up there throwing eighty eight. I hate it facing those guys. Right. So it's like so that means something so what we're going to do is we're going to try to shape this team and and as i said before is it's not um them them it is them getting to know me but it's also me getting to know them and i think Mm -hmm. i always said it's coaching for me it's like it's like raising kids you can have one kid you can say one thing to one to the kid and they're going to do it and the next your other baby's not going to do it they don't understand so you're 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 dealing with personalities so my my job is to find what makes these guys get the best out of them and so it's different personalities and we got to figure out really quick like what it is and we're going to really figure figure out who's a winner and who's not a winner. Everybody wants to win, right? Everybody says the right thing. Everybody says they want to win. But they don't know how to win. And that's where we're going to we're going to do the difference. We're going to make sure you know how to win. And uh Kobe Bryant, I think, uh said it best is he he and Michael Jordan practiced harder than they played the game came pretty easy to them because they've already been through it in practice so that's what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to change a culture around here to where they understand the games are easy i mean that they already know what they're doing we want to put them in situations to where they're failing in practice and they're not embarrassing themselves because there's no one around but their teammates and us yeah the hardest thing you ever do is in practice the games will come easy exactly whatever it is the game of life baseball it doesn't matter Right. And that's what we want them to do. I mean, you, you, everything, like I said before, you, you learn in life, you learn through failure. You, you know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And right. that's a different story. You know, we can't keep making these same mistakes over and over again, expecting different results. So that's when we got to find someone to replace you. And so, yeah, I can handle the, the physical mistakes. I can't handle the mental mistakes. You know, if we can't, we don't know the game of baseball, that's my fault. Uh, and I think in a game, I think as a coach, I'm evaluating, uh, the coaching staff and myself of how we prepare for that game and how we prepare for practice. No, I mean, I'm going to back the players and we're going to do all that stuff, but you know, you want to see, are they getting it? And if they're not getting it, then we got to coach them a different way because they're not, it's not their fault. It's our fault that they didn't get it. We we had selection committees um, that were ruthless, and you would be judged by your last game. Um, and if you had a shitty last game, the chances are you could be replaced by the second team player that was vying for your position in the first team. And it was ruthless. Um, and and there's an element of that ruthlessness that I think is a very positive thing to keep that fire lit underneath a player. Um, so that he performs to his maximum ability every time he turns out on the pitch. 
or the park or the field, the, the dam, whatever it is. At least use any American reference you can. Anything well, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying. Anything other than I'm trying. Pitch. But I'm, I'm just saying the heat of a selection committee that judges you on your previous game's performance, um, it can be too ruthless. But sometimes it's the fire that you need to put under a player to say, you didn't perform at your best in that game and we don't know why. And that's a mental issue. So I agree with you 100% on the mental aspects as to how you approach a game to win it. So if your head's in the right place, chances are you're going to win. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely... That's definitely part of it. I mean, you want, there's some guys like, uh, who have track records, uh, like a Baxter that hit 400 here. He's going to have every opportunity to show that he can't do it. Right. Whereas you get a young guy out there, he needs to do it pretty quickly because yeah. we need to be able to get him going. Uh, and it's just like the big leagues. I mean, we used to say it all the time, Edwin Encarnacion, if you look it up, he is the worst hitter ever in the history of baseball in April. So we went to his <laughs> locker every single day in spring training and I took a calendar with me every day and we put May one. May 1, May 1, and spring training. And we did May 1, and we did May 1 all the time. He was like American League hitter of the month like for like five years. Wow. Awesome. And it's like, so you knew what you're getting out of him because he's done it before. And we're like, can you please just think it's May? Can you please think it's May? And he's like, well, Just yeah. start the engine a little yeah, quicker. Yeah. Just, I mean, we're like, just we, we gave him more at bats in spring training. We gave him less at bats in spring training because he would come in the first day and be like, oh, hamstring. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't nothing wrong with it. There's too long of a spring for him. He's like, I don't need but a week to get ready because he's pretty much dh in them. But you're right. I mean, so if, if the guy has a track record, you're going to hang with him a little bit longer than you would with a guy that doesn't. But, you yeah, you also want to be able to, you know, if there's a pitcher out there and you need to get him to get through two outs or whatever, you want to go out and talk to him because you want to build confidence in him to let him know, hey, I'm not jerking you every single time you get in trouble or a guy that makes an error or strikes out the bases loaded. So that's that fine line of, uh, I think, player-coach relationship. Yeah, and that's, exactly, that's exactly what and, it is. And the thing, the thing in life, I mean, everything in life is about communication, right? Yeah. So if you're communicating with him beforehand, letting him know, hey, you got two hitters here and – regardless of what happens you're coming out and that's probably what happens with skeins and then they probably said you got this in and then you're gonna and so he probably didn't make a big deal about it but if you don't tell them that then all of a sudden yeah then it becomes upset yeah, yeah. Were, were, it just hit my mind were you there when Encarnacion hit like 58 home runs I was there after he was always 40. He was in the sport. He was in forties uh, uh, when I was with the blue Jays, but he's always around at 285, 290 mark. Uh, but I mean, he was an RBI machine. I mean, it, everyone's, Really, he's the one that made Donaldson get win the MVP because they had to pitch somebody, right. and, and so Donaldson, and then you know, yeah, Edwin kind of made Jose Bautista because mm-hmm. Donaldson and Bautista would strike out a lot, and could I say didn't strike out very much? I mean, he'd go through ruts and mm-hmm. stuff, but oh, he he's still that middle of the lineup. I mean, oh, there's three. That's he'd go, Poppy, don't worry about it. I got it today, and I'm like, huh. hey, as long as you feel good, buddy. <laughs> Where do you want me? Where do you want me to throw this? That's ball confidence. Where do you want me to throw the ball? Like, that's, that's what this. you want. That's great. Yeah, he was awesome. Well, I know so, we've talked a lot about community and getting the community back involved here at Ferrum and through some conversations you and I had on the phone. Do you want to speak a little bit to what your vision is and what you want to do here? Well, there's a lot of, there's, uh, I want to actually get the, um, get the support back here. Um, even from the local businesses and stuff, I think we're going to try to do some, uh, signage and stuff like that, uh, to where we it can actually generate revenue, but it also brings the community together. I'd like to have a retro night, maybe where we have Bowen's hot dogs out here and we have a, you know, where the students maybe, you know, they get a dollar off a hot dog or whatever we can do to bring, you know, bring the community back out here. Uh, have Franklin County High School, have the, uh, local, um, travel teams come out here and, and, and let them shag for batting practice with us, you know, saying so just be on the field mm-hmm. and, and bring in, bring in the parents and roping this thing off and, and having uh, my special assistant since he's not senior, having him walk <laughs> them down, having him walk him down so they can watch batting practice and try to bring the community back together and, and just have special nights for people. You know, we're going to have a Russell Walton award, uh, stuff like that. And, you know, we're going to bring back other guys and things like that. But I just wanted to make, to be where we're, where the community is was like it was when I was here. You got a Bowen's hot dogs when I played here. They at least and all of them knew who you were. And mm-hmm. uh, you go down to Rocky Mountain, you go in Ippies, everyone knew who you yep. were. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was it was a good time, right? So we want to bring those guys back to here because I think everybody wants it. 
And I think it's time for us to get Farham College back on the map and make sure that make sure that Franklin County, Roanoke area. I've gotten so many people from Roanoke, from Martinsville, from Patrick County. They're they're back in on this thing uh, with yeah. us, and and that's a great thing. When you get the community support around you, now we can start moving mountains, and we can we can accelerate this thing. Right mm-hmm. when you're trying to do it by yourself, it is tough. I mean, you're not gonna get you're not getting community support, and you're looking for failure. Right. About the baseball camps, they still do them here for the kids anymore? Not like they used to, but Eric's bringing them back. I think and, uh, because I was a alumni of that. Well, I think that's that's critical because, like somebody like me in Patrick County, I would not have known about Ferrum but for that camp, and it was exciting for me as a kid. You know, um, going that. I mean, I remember I can remember the actual uh, brochure had Abe's face on the front. You know, Abe Knapp. Coach that must Abe have been Knapp. a big front. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, Abe. Oh, man. But that- <laughs> I didn't say nothing. But speaking of that, I know you have I know two two more prospect camps coming up, a younger one well, and it's, an older it's, one. It's, it's an older one and a younger one. What happened is, is when I got here, they had one camp going on uh, for the younger kids. And then the parents, uh, it was so hot that day. So I brought the parents up here and let them sit up here in the air condition. They were like, oh, my gosh, this is the best thing ever. And I gave them bottled waters and stuff. And they said, uh, let us know if you're going to do another one. And I'm like, oh, well, then we might as well do another one. And the prospect camp is more – it's much more for – um Kids who are interested in Farham College, and that's from like grade nine all the way through. I say grade nine. I'm that's still Canadian. Canadian. Freshman in high school through uh, JUCO guys, and you know I like to see a lot of the Franklin County high school kids come out, and so I can just see them, right? And I'm gonna go down and see them and watch them play because we can't lose Franklin County, we can't lose Roanoke, we can't lose Martins or Patrick County, we can't lose these players to Christopher Newport and those guys. Uh, we should be able to keep our family home and have him driving up the road and be proud to go up the road. I was be just able to- talking about that with coach Shelton this weekend. Yeah. I talked to him too. So, and I mean, so I'm making my rounds with these guys and Barry, the other Barry Shelton at Tunstall high Tunstall. school was my former coach. So, uh, you know, I'll have that district, uh, as well. And I just want to be able to, to bring these kids in and, and from around this region and, and know that, Times are changing here at Farham College, and the best way is, like I said, I mean, you get them out there, you let them play, you know, you do some drills, you let them do mm-hmm. batting practice and stuff in the mornings, and then you start playing games because you're going to see how they react, right? And then you can start weeding out. And then my thing is, as far as recruiting, uh, as Abe said, I get 25, 30 emails or phone calls a day. Is we got to rank these kids? Like, if we can't get number one, our top shortstop, we need to get to number two. If we can't get number two, we go to number three. So you probably go ten deep at each position and, and plus the pitching and plus what it does here. If you come to prospect camp here at Farham college from North Carolina or somewhere like that, you're pretty interested in coming to Farham college. So for yeah, me, you've made like, a choice. Yeah. You're, you're telling me that you're interested in coming here. You're willing to do this. And then that, that, that puts a, it, it turns the light bulb on in my, in my head going, okay, this guy, he's coming. I got a guy coming from New York. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, that means, I mean, right now he's got three feathers in his cap. Only thing he needs to do is show me he can play because you're going to make that commitment. I got a guy, I got one kid from Charlotte, North Carolina is coming. Uh, so we got kids and, but I want to bring back the community around here because I think there's enough talent around this area to win. To be honest with you, yeah, you can get people from our, our, our other places, but I mean, I'd just rather be able to do Southwest Virginia and that area and Northern Virginia some. And there's so much talent here. You see, like Franklin County, you see yeah, I know there's a couple of kids on Franklin County is going to be seniors that are pretty good ball players. I mean, what I've seen, watch them play this, fr- this spring. Now, Abe is uh, Abe has gotten me on with a couple of those guys too. So we're we're looking at. I mean, like, like I said, I mean, I, I want to try to get them here so that they can see the difference and and what it is right now. And the thing is, is we got to make sure everyone's a match, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, just because, like I said, just because I'm Eric Hans doesn't mean I'm going to match with everybody. And I don't, exactly. I don't. As uh, Nick Sabian said, if I was in the business of pleasing everybody, I'd be uh, selling, uh, giving out ice cream on Forty West <laughs> on the way down, right? So you're not in the business of pleasing people so you're in the business of winning and and and, and producing young men right. that can go out in the community so we want to be able to bring uh, like i said bring all these kids back here and be able to let them see me let them feel like because 
if they can come here and they visit and they come here and they do a prospect camp or something, you know, you know what it feels like, right? And the more they can be here, the more they'll feel like it's home or the more they'll feel like it's distance because this is a different place to be. There's no doubt about it. But once you're here, it's the best years of your life. I've said it all along and I played nine years in the big leagues, parts of nine years, coached for parts of 12 years and all that stuff. And, and I always said, if I ha- ever had to do over again, I'd like to go back and do my three years at Farum one more time just to go back and do this thing one more time. So I've gotten well, really gotten a chance to come back. Pretty good years after, oh. after being, you know, the NCAA Player of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was I wanted the championship. I mean, yeah, it was great to be able to get that. And I told Abe that that spring I wanted to be the. But I, I would trade that, and I think there's a majority of players out there that wins MVPs mm-hmm. that, that they would rather be. I'd rather been able to hold uh, win a the uh, team been on top win a World right. Series championship for Fairham College instead of just winning the individual award. Individual awards are great, but being a part of a team and you got teammates you can celebrate with is more important for me here's a great example eric we got word of a um, good looking player up in the valley league eric calls and talks to him he said what's your last name again he tells i play with your dad <laughs> <laughs> in the big leagues what there's a, an opener. What a connection there's an opener <laughs> yeah he's coming Boom. to fair nice. there you go nice but his younger brother you is in oklahoma now and the father wow. said he's coming also wow. next year. Good things are happening. Just because he knew Eric mm-hmm. and how Eric played. Yep. Well, he knows the culture that's going to be here. Right. He knows what he's getting into. And, and this kid's from New York, went to a junior college yep. in Florida, and he's going to be in Fairfield. Wow. He's going to have some culture shock, but hey, if he can play, <laughs> bring him on. Well, he's already he's playing in baseball. Covington, so he should oh, be okay. Well, he's good then. He might think this is Beverly he Hills. Hadn't, he <laughs> hadn't run into, <laughs> wait a minute, wait. He has not run into any gardens in the Covington, base, has he? The bases aren't any different. That's right. Same, than they are same distance. Oh, hell, they're still 90 <laughs> feet. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but the ride five miles up out of way and five blocks <laughs> yeah. in New York City is two this different ball games. It creates a better atmosphere for studying and practicing. That's right. Because there's nothing else. Especially when they fall on your red. You follow him in that red we truck up a hill. We're not going to yeah. do that anymore. We're not going to do that anymore. We're <laughs> That's old school. Does he still have that red truck? It's probably sitting around somewhere. <laughs> it might not run. <laughs> I think that's important though is is you know you kind of joke about it. there ain't nothing up here really to do to get in trouble and obviously that's we got a lot of trouble up here and even when I was in high school and college for some of Abe's ball players but there's trouble everywhere well you gotta make but it's, right. it's, it's, it's what you make of it it's tradition and and I think that's part of what I think Eric and them want to get back to is is the tradition of fair and baseball fair and mm-hmm. basketball um, fair and football I mean back then fair and college teams, those mm-hmm. teams were feared. I mean, yeah. I remember mm-hmm. you talking, I think, on the first podcast, me and you did with them, you know, back in that time period that you tried to play tech in the fall. They wouldn't even play you. I mean, it, <laughs> the teams were feared. It three times. Yeah, the teams the were fall, feared. I mean, don't want to play, play them. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is like, when we did hang out together, whether it be in dorm rooms, pretty much that's what it is, unless you went to Roanoke or Rocky Mountain really wasn't that big back then. But if you, if you had a, a party in your room, well, the football team was there and half the basketball team was there right. too. And mm-hmm. it used to be the hill up here. They used to call it. And oh yeah. So the apartment. So it'd be three of them throwing it and everybody be outside. And so that's, I mean, not that I'm saying I'm trying to bring that part back, but you bring that camaraderie back to where, sure. the yeah, you got Chris sure. Warren sitting in your room with you, you know, and you, listening to music and stuff and you got Roman small. So it's just bringing back the community. And I know guy is it's a different era right now, but that part of it should not change for mm-hmm. me. It's like you support each other and you're out there for you because you know, you don't ever know when you're going to need somebody or, you know, in life and especially outside of life. If you make mm-hmm. another friend here is on a football team, he might own a business somewhere where you can, exactly. you can go in and, right. and get a job. Well, I mean, it was funny. You know, I, I, I told my dad that I talked to you on the phone the other week and, told him you're coming back and be the coach and stuff. And he said, I still remember that trip we took to Cincinnati. He's one of the nicest guys I ever remember <laughs> playing at Farum. I mean, you know, it, it just – you made an impression on my dad. I mean, well, that's going to hit home just, around here too. There's a lot of kids my age yeah. and younger that have kids that remember, you know, watching y'all come yeah, through exactly. here and watching y'all mm-hmm. on Sports Center and, and they're going to be telling their kids, well, hey, you know, that's a good place to go up here and play ball. It's something, you know, similar of, you know, it's something of our – relic of our past is kind of coming back, you know, to to a certain degree and and – well, I was kind of talking about coming up here and not getting in so much trouble or getting into trouble. That's kind of a good thing. I think I think that's something the kids are going to start yearning for. I think so many kids are now inundated with devices and speed and conveniences and a, and a 
Lowe's and a Walmart, and I'm, I, that's old people stuff with the young people like uh, Starbucks or whatever <laughs> on every single corner. You know, they come up here, hum, they, I think people, kids are going to want to start getting away and humble themselves because they always naturally rebel and everybody's parents now has got their, you know, they're in their phone and going to Starbucks. Their kids, well, I'm going to go to fair and get away from all that crap. You know what I mean? I think there's a, you know, the tide, will shine, the, the tide is, is shifting, uh, shifting mm-hmm. and the pendulum swinging back in another direction. So I think it's a perfect time to come in here and start something new. You know, you're moving up to D2. You know, you're bringing back a little bit of the past, but you're kind of, you know, finding a way to infuse it with the future. And I think, uh, I think that's the way. I think people are wanting to come back to places like this where it's quiet, where they can get away, where they don't have to sit there. And, you know, we've seen kind of what a scandal It's quiet until we feel. Is on bigger universities it's just a degree meal come here where you have smaller classes we could actually learn from some you know from from people not just your professors you learn from people that's a great thing about schools like this you're not mm-hmm. just learning from the professors you learn from every you're learning from locals you know you ain't nothing like going down to bowlings and sitting beside some you know drunk has been married for 34 years <laughs> that's good marriage advice right there for you as you're thinking you know <laughs> that's gonna be good marriage advice for you I think I got to hear a little quick then on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you will, you'll learn a lot in this town. So I encourage everybody to do it. I know we went on about an hour and a half, but we'll, we'll go ahead and get, I know people got things to do, get out of here. I hope we can do it again. I hope we can do it more often. Cause, uh, you know, if you back in town, there's a plethora of people, you know, if we, you know, Carter mentioned something about maybe trying to get together more often and doing it to getting, getting the word out there. We're getting ready to go move up in the world with cameras and, and bigger events. And me and Chip got some stuff working with some, you know, but, but for us, yeah, we can reach out to, you know, when Nick's in town, say, Nick, you come up here and get on this show, you know, get one of the 700 Hodges is in Rocky Mount that plays baseball to come up here and get on the show. <laughs> um, you know, we can get Billy down here one time. There's tons of people around the area that might just want to come down and get on a show. We come, we talk a little bit of baseball. We always talk about fair and baseball, what's been going on, what's happening. We can break, you know, Abe wants to tell some of those, you know, stories of the crazy stuff they used to do back when, uh, I just wonder if well, you that's, know, if what. Eric, you mentioned a little while ago that Al Leiter had your number. How'd you do against Billy Wagner in your program? Oh, cool oh. question. Is Billy going to hear this one? Oh, no. Is he going to hear this one? <laughs> he hey. doesn't pay for that. Uh, no. Uh, actually, early in my career, I struggled against him uh, a little bit. Then I, um, and once I got to San Diego, and there again, playing for Bruce Bochy, I had so much confidence. It didn't matter who was on the mound. Uh, he let me play, and he didn't care if I was 0 for 4, 4 for 4. I knew I was playing the next day, and I started getting to Billy a little bit. Then I had a game-winning home run off of him in Houston uh, that – that I'll never l- let him not live down. Can, can, can he's say someone that's throwing ninety nine. He's gonna be in the Hall of Fame. And I'm like, you know what? I got a Hall of Famer. I got you. Please say it one more time. I mean, I hit a game winning home run. Actually, that game, I went into that game hitting two thirty. I was struggling a little bit, and I went five for six. Jose Lima was uh, uh, um, pitching, and I went five for six. I owned him, and then Billy came in. I hit a home run to right field, which never happened. <laughs> Uh, and it, it, I mean, it barely got out. I think the, it was, oh, that, no, it was pen scraper, but he had to buy lunch the next day. So that was outstanding because I had to, but you know what? I mean, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate you guys having us on here because we got to bring this back and you guys are, are, are an avenue for us to be able to go down and be able to have on more often, whether it be once a week, once a month, I know baseball season, especially as these playoffs come up in baseball and stuff like that. Kids need to understand October, but it's nothing better than October baseball to watch. When's your opening going. game? That's well, that's saying. a good question. It's going to be in the spring. Uh, we got, we, we, we will have some, uh, fall inner squads. I, I'd love for the, uh, for the public to be able to come out and watch us just practice. I mean, it's, it's something that, that you can come into. You can come out and practice. Uh, you know, we'd probably be at three o'clock to around seven o'clock at night, somewhere along in there. Um, and we want to be able to just bring the community back. And, you know, if it's hot, come up here and we'll give you a bottle of water, or whatever. But we got to bring the community back. And I think it's best by doing stuff like this because this is what a lot of people listen to. And the more that we can do this and get it out there, yep. the quicker we're going to get it back. So as you, as Abe said earlier, I'm, I'm not a real bit patient guy. So I'm trying to, we're trying to jumpstart this thing. And, you know, the only way I know how to do it is to jumpstart, jumpstart the program and see if we can, uh, it doesn't mean wins and losses, but it means the way the brand of baseball that's being played. And everyone knows you can the see culture. the talent out there, the but yep. if you're, if you're creating the culture, eventually, you know, Mike Krzyzewski had to start somewhere. Dean Smith had to start somewhere. Exactly. All those old school guys, they had to start somewhere and they just started building a culture. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to build this thing to where everybody's proud of Farham college and, and, before I'm done here, I want to be able to play for multiple World Series and, I mean, and we'll let just fall. Different, but when you came here, I mean, you you took it from where it was at and run with Absolutely it. Absolutely, did into a great program. I mean, 
You, you look at all those banners out there. There's yeah. S. Abe Naff. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, there's good players that come in, but I mean, like I talked about Nick Sabian and those guys, you can have good players, but you still got to coach them. I and it's actually, it's more pressure. I used to say it all the time to our minor league coaches. You know, it's more pressure on you this year. We got seven prospects sitting out there that need to be able to, you should win, right? Whereas you get some ragtags out there. You're like, mm, you know, you, you, you're you going to be good this year. You can, if you get one or two to pop, we're, we're doing well. Okay, yeah. So when you have talent, it's, it's actually more pressure pressure on you to win than it is when you don't have talent. So uh, I, th- I know he enjoyed that pressure and, and he he pushed us and he treated every single one of us the same. It didn't matter if it was Billy Wagner to myself, to Brandy Lawrence. I mean, we had all kinds of all America. We all were treated the same and we all played together as a team. When no one thought anybody was better than the other one, we all just came out there. And when it came game time, Baron called, everyone knew that we, we were out there. We were out there for blood i mean we were not gonna set no losing was not an option back then and then when it was it was like we were shocked yeah i've never been to a baseball game how about that never. so i look forward to doing to being the first one here that is make sure you sit beside carter <laughs> oh we got yes, it you did. we got it. i will come equipped <laughs> you've never been to a no no never been to a, a baseball body, game not a it's not cricket not now it's not cricket not, not one never been to don't one get him on that now. let's not go down that let's not go down that rabbit so hole cricket <laughs> So let, let's let's make my first one here. That's awesome. Let's do it. Well, I let him sit beside Carter, so he every time he's got a question, Carter, he, he just that's it. Yeah, what the hell happened there? That's I will say, if you guys don't mind, we're gonna do a um, a uh, all American golf tournament um, homecoming weekend for football. So that'll be October the eighteenth. Uh, we're gonna do it at Floyd. So uh, we're just trying to get uh, we'll get some of the former All Americans, and hopefully we we'll get some groups together and play for that. So we're just trying to we're trying to do some things. We're gonna do. Uh, I know we're going to do some vintage uh, Abe Naff and uh, Eric Owens and Billy Wagner uniforms uh, so they can be sold to the kids and to the to the public out here. Oh, okay. An on location yeah. podcast in Florida. Oh, it could be. Yeah, so that would be really good for the t- for the golf tournament. So, yeah. Team Thomas. Well, I mean, well, we can we can do it early. It can be an early podcast, and you yeah. know, people. Yeah, can we definitely want do. we want you guys to get that do out there to play. the community because the more that we can have for this stuff, and the more that we yeah, can sure. uh, we can raise money, the more that we can do jumbotrons, we can do new batting cages, we can do all this stuff. So we we're gonna need the help from Franklin County and the surrounding areas, and and doing this uh, doing this podcast and, and things like that. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and like I said, hopefully I just mentioned Thomas, you know, I kind of gave me an idea. Like there's so many former players that live around here and they might have not played the same time period as you, but bringing them on and, and, and just letting them talk, like just talking baseball, I think is, is important. So uh, I'd love to get Thomas in here at some point in time and go over the differences. And do you think you could get Thomas to say anything? Oh, I don't know. He's kind of shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to I'll work you, on him. I tell he's you what, shy. he was, he was a great player. I love coaching him. I think about baseball players. It's either they're very eccentric and they'll, they'll, they know how to talk like NASCAR drivers or they are tight lipped and reserved. And you can't get enough. Like Nick is very reserved, very, it's hard to you get got, You got to pull him. it out of him. It mm-hmm. really is. Like Ron Hodges, I tried and tried to, you know, I tried and tried, God rest him for years to get him on the show and come talk. Couldn't do it. You know, Ron just, you know how it is. Brian, just, just, Brian just, Strong was mm-hmm. one of the greatest yeah. hitters mm-hmm. to play here. And, but these old stories are what we want. I mean, we need to. He just wouldn't say. You know, we, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose it. The silent killer. It's one or the other. You either get nothing or you get everything. Mm-hmm. So so that's always a lot of fun. So hopefully we can get Thomas in there. I know he'll got something to say. Just hopefully he don't uh, he don't help me out too much. So. Either but, that or you'll be doing a lot of bleeping. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, uh, Thomas will be fine. He <laughs> needs to come back. He does. He needs to come on back up here. I ain't seen him well, in a while. I mean, while, that's part of tradition, getting those guys game. back here. Did, no matter where they played him. Randy Lawrence, he was a really good player. If you don't believe me, you can ask him. He'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, he, will, he will tell you. He will tell you how good he was. Be like a helicopter pilot. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, thank y'all, gentlemen, for showing up here. Thank now you. Fairham thank you. A, a Division two school. They got that NIL money. The uh, <laughs> best way that you can help them get that NIL money is by becoming a member at patreon.com slash get on tap for only $3 a month. That's just a minimum, just a dime a day. And if we get 10,000 of y'all to come out there and be subscribers, then we can give a few thousand dollars a month to try and grease the pockets of some kid to come up here. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it all works in session. <laughs> what a great so, idea. I love that idea. That's the best thing. I've heard all day. Hell of a concept, right? <laughs> right. So we need y'all to go become a subscriber. And hey, look, if you're a subscriber, there's a chance you might get to come up here and sit down and, and uh, listen to one of these shows we do up here in the 
in the uh, the press room up here right above the field or with nice. or Billy, whoever. Yeah. You know, maybe you can just sit over in the corner and listen because the stories hopefully we're going to have in the near future when we get uh, get Abe back and maybe a couple drinks into him and <laughs> then, then start really listening to see what he's got to say about them old stories. So thank you all for coming up here today. Thank you for uh, your time. Baseball, give them a, give them a follow on uh, social media and Farm College in general. Start paying attention to what's going on here in the near future. We'll start keeping tabs on everything going in here. So tune back in here for yep. updates. Watch this space for sure. It's it's gonna it's gonna get lively. Yeah, let's um, get it on. Yeah, I think we had a lot of cool stuff coming up in mm-hmm. the near future. So, Eric, Coach Knauf, Carter, like, Chip, thank you, thank you. Enjoyed Bye. it, guys. Enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. I hang in there with a rowdy crowd. I drink too much and I laugh too loud. That's how I'll always be I roll my own every now and then I love a good buzz with a few close friends That's just me That's how I'll always be Won't hear me That's how I'll